You know, in Isaiah chapter 54, in the 14th verse, 13 and 14, Isaiah chapter 54. And all your children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. In righteousness shalt thou be established. And now, folks, as I began my Christian pilgrimage as a very young fellow, and uh, Life can be full of detours and you can become a kind of spiritual vagrant and vagabond. You know, just flitting about, doing very little really, going here, going there, entertaining yourself. Now, I wanted to be saved from all these detours, all this superfluous activity. So here I was. I needed to be established in righteousness. You know, one time up and one time down. Well, well, well. Suppose the plane which is carrying you somewhere, if one time it goes up and then it hits the ground again, and what happens? You won't get anywhere. You'll be found amidst the wreckage. You will be established in righteousness. So, we see a lot of activity. And it's amazing how idolatry and idolatrous religions can be full of activity and full of great money offerings. Commercialism is driving religion today. And I don't believe in anything which is driven by commercialism. At the heart of commercialism, you know, you have the strong tendency to have false balance. And our very mindset can get corrupt with this gain and self-gain. But the Lord Jesus Christ has a question concerning profit and loss. It's this. What shall it profit a man? if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. Any gain there? None. Gains the whole world and loses his own soul. What doth it profit? Said the Lord Jesus. Of course, there's no profit in that. But, you know, we have to be mindful of these distractions. Spiritual idolatry is a thing that can come to any person. 
as a matter of fact, the devil tried to stump me, bowl me over, by trying to plant some idol in my heart, some distraction that will cause me to digress from going straight ahead in the narrow way. Now, after 71 years of service, you know, we don't need either senility or spiritual innovation. Kind of stressed state when we feel, okay, we have done this, we have done that. No, 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 no. Somehow, God has given me a mindset which tells me you have done hardly anything, which is a great help to me. The Holy Spirit never flatters you. The devil does. So, if you feel that you are doing a capital job you know, and doing a splendidly. That's one of the things that shocked me very much when I arrived on these shores in 1958, long before some of you saw sunlight. <laughs> well, you know, my friends, that's what shocked me. Everyone appeared to be quite complacent. Yeah, well, we are doing a great job over here. And as I looked around, I said to myself, why? Lord, why did you bring me here? I see that folks do not want to be revived. They don't see the need for revival. Why did you bring me here? I went out by the cliffs in Devon and cried to God. Then when God began to move, like in Uist in the Hebrides, where revival broke out, and in certain places in Ireland. Well, I was a little encouraged, but not satisfied. However, you know, with such distances to span and cover, and being so greatly limited in myself. You know, I needed to grow and grow a great deal. About that time, I lost my dad while I was still quite young. His rebuke was always a strong, well-directed, well-timed rebuke. Sometimes he would say to me, you are getting proud. I would be shocked. But then the Lord would confirm what Daddy had said. I needed those rebukes. You know, there are too many people who don't want a word of exhortation. They don't want a rebuke. They will go only where they are flattered. My dear friends, 
better are the rebukes of one than the kisses of an enemy. So, being established in righteousness is what is needed. Can you think of the horrible letdown that one feels? Someone said this man was picked up for drugs or this man was caught drunken. Who? Celebrated Singapore. What? How can such a thing happen? I had to go to visit a friend who was under treatment. How it was that alcoholism had taken hold, I do not know. But I had to make a journey in order that the testimony of the Lord should not be destroyed by this well-known person. Now, my dear friends, some of these things are absolutely shocking. Now, as I had found, Confirmed alcoholics and the people who were dealing in this trade, bootlegging, being transformed, never to touch that stuff again. You know, the power that is in the cross to save people from the grips of sin. It must be continually demonstrated. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be able to operate in certain areas if people believe in reverting to their old ways. Because some of them would then revert to head hunting. Do you know what that means? They were head hunters. And it was a part of their experience to find their dads returning home with human heads stuck on a spike. To bring love into those hearts for those who, whom they had hunted down, down the centuries. Yes, it's not humanly possible to do that. It is the Lord who not only redeems but establishes people in righteousness. Look at this modern trend. I was traveling one day from Oxford and uh, a young fellow was traveling in the other corner of the compartment. He said, do you mind if I came and sat with you? Oh, I said, please come. And then, of course, I was soon sharing with him what the Lord had done for me. And you know, my friends, he said, we don't have such Christians in Oxford. I said, what? Yes, I know my friends and others. They go to bed with girls. You know, he didn't seem to have any notion. He knew deep in his heart that this was wrong. But he thought that was how it was. 
Every attempt is being made today in Britain by the general and universal connivance of most commentators and writers to make sin appear most attractive. As though that's the done thing and should be kept up. My dear friends, let me tell you this. If we manage to produce a Christian church where there is no holiness, you can bury it. The world won't miss it. If it is only big talk, you can just bury it. Good riddance. But holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. But where is that holiness to be found? The Beatles went to try and recover something from the Himalayan sadhus or those who were meditating over there. But let me tell you, my dear friends, last year, a young man rescued, you know, one of those Brahmin priests, rescued from suicide, bent on suicide, was brought to me, or at least he wanted to see me. Now, I prayed with him, and this year he brought his younger brother, another priest. You see, they have some special learning and training and conduct the prayers or chants or pujas, as they are called. He brought his brother who was very anxious for prayer and his sister. They wanted me to take over their sister and take care of her. Fully convinced that they were only driving a trade fully convinced that in all their rites and ritual, there was no truth or reality. All right. And here we have people, pilgrims from Britain, who must go and learn from some of these men And I asked this priest, where did you learn this drug habit? He said, all of us who are sadhus or sannyasis, all of us are into drugs. I'm not an exception. You see, my dear friends, and today we don't have to simulate a religious high, an emotional high, by the beat of the drum and by the rhythm and the decibel, high decibel sound. You know, that may be convey a lot of enthusiasm to some people. But let me tell you, that doesn't last. It's a bubble that bursts. 
I will establish you in righteousness. Now may I ask you, are you established in righteousness? You turn away from evil and say, I cannot sully my conscience. I cannot bring shame to my Savior. I cannot crucify him afresh and put him to open shame. Yes, that is urgently required that people should find in you a reliable guide, a trustworthy witness, not somebody who flutters with the winds that fly. No, my dear friends. You know, I was a sportsman. You know that. Many of you knew. And uh, I used to almost revere sports. You see, I lived uh, in a kind of fantasy world of sport. Whatever it is, I found in Jesus Christ some, someone who gave me much, much more than sport ever offered to me. But you know how crazy Europe has been and in fact the whole world. Uh, this last month and uh, how special police precautions had to be taken against the invasion of British fans. Did you hear of that? You have a football game or a soccer game and you have to take police precautions because the fans are coming. From where? From UK. <laughs> well, it, and uh, I do not know. I did not have the time to follow all those things, you know. I do not know what depredations some of those cities were subjected to and other things like that. But the Bible tells me that one of the first sportsmen, in fact, the first sportsman mentioned in the Bible was Esau. If you turn to Genesis chapter 25 and verse 27, and the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter. I don't know how many horses he had though and how many foxes he slew. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Well, you know, my dear friends, I used to speak very highly of sportsmen, but no longer. When people have to rely on drugs, performance enhancing drugs, you have taken the heart out of sport and fair play. Well, what about this young man, Esau? This young man, Esau, turned up one day after hunting, quite exhausted apparently, and found his younger brother, Jacob, 
and Jacob was having some very delicious pottage on the coals or fire. 29th verse, Esau came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray you, with that same red pottage. For I am faint. Therefore was his name called Esau. And Jacob said, Sell me this day your birthright. What did it imply? You are the inheritor of the blessings of Abraham. Sell me this day your birthright. And what was the response of Esau? Esau said, See, I am likely to die being faint. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? Imagine. When God spoke to Abraham, he said, Blessing, I will bless you. And make you a blessing. Everyone that blesseth you will be blessed. And everyone that curseth you will be cursed. And this wide charter, which was bequeathed, given to God by Abraham and then passed on to Isaac, the father of Jacob and Esau, was treated with scant respect. What does it profit me? You know, today the world says the same thing. What does virginity profit? My dear friends, let me tell you. Someone who throws away chastity and virginity never seems to settle down. Never. I don't know what it is. What makes them so restive, fickle, fitful, dissatisfied? What? Do you need a whole harem? In the old sultan fashion? I suppose one of those demands that are going to be made, that is going to be made in the, shortly in Britain, is that harems should be permitted by law. Or that multiple partnerships should be totally legalized. And there should be no strictures against pedophiles. That should be just taken in stride. Part of the normal entertainment which some of the big people require. Including churchmen. Well, where are we headed, folks? Where are we headed? Down the road that Esau went. That's all it is. Down the road to self-destruction. Down the road to sinking Britain in the ocean. Of sin and sex.
how grievous. What is this birthright? What is this blessing of a God going to do for me when I'm on the point to die? Look at the commitment, the poor commitment. Of course, that's no commitment. But here was one inheriting the great blessing. And look at that attitude. Wow. What is this going to do to me? You know, a pile of money seems to be a great temptation today. I say to people, all right, suppose you're given 50,000. Do you mean to say that 50,000 is going to turn you into a dishonest person? whose accounts can't be trusted? Or suppose you were given 500 million or a billion. Would that mean that you would want to stash away something secretly and be afraid to disclose your accounts? Is money, is the amount of money going to be determine the validity of your righteousness? Then you're no Christian. The cross is nothing to you. Your heart is in that money. Your righteousness is not the righteousness of Christ. My dear friends, it's all very nice to be debating the doctrine of imputation of righteousness. I am seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus and all that. It's all very well. But I want you to come down to brass tacks and tell me, is it a righteousness that will still stand firm before the temptation of money or of impurity? Are you established in righteousness? Folks, I cannot come to terms in these matters. Truth is truth. Untruth is untruth. No matter where you find it, if you find it in this pulpit, don't you ever waste your time listening to one word of mine. God gives you a pure heart and a clean conscience. Look at this. And this young man was to inherit the untold blessings of Abraham, which God had given Abraham. And look at his total unpreparedness. The Bible also has this to say, about Esau, if you turn to the 26th chapter and the 34th verse, and Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Berai, the Hittite, and Bashemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, which were a grief of my mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. He had brought in strange women. Maybe they were attractive. But they were a grief of mind to Isaac, the dad and mom. 
And you can see this happening today. So, the girl who you, whom you bring in should seal the coffin of your parents. Is that a loving design and purpose? That was the nature of this young man. Oh, I'm a sportsman, so I can do anything. I can quit my wife when she is five months pregnant. My! Can you imagine a celebrated for British footballer quitting his wife when she is five months pregnant? and going off to another girl. I wouldn't let that fellow play for me if I were the coach. Under no circumstances. He would quit the team as well and leave us all in the lurch. Well, well, well. You know, when morals decline, character caves in, the nation perishes. That's how it is. You may be a celebrated sportsman, but when you treat the laws of God lightly and the vows at the altar lightly and you treat a wife lightly, And you treat your parents lightly, like this young man did. Let me tell you, you are a never do wheel. Nothing good will come. Thou shalt be established in the righteousness. Money won't shake you, the storms of life won't shake you, the flesh and an avalanche of sex devouring Britain will not shake you. Let us pray. Let us tell God, let me never go the path which Esau chose. Establish me in the righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. That is proof against whatever the devil might pit against you. Lord our God, while we want to count up the crumbs, while we want to fill our baskets with the remnants so that we can praise you at every count of your blessings. Count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. We want to do that, Lord. And at the same time, we don't want to flatter ourselves. We want to be a humble people. We have every reason to be very humble. Because whatever we might have done is a mere drop in a huge bucket. Precious Lord, we give you all the glory. And yet, we cannot but claim everyone who is here as well as those that are in the unseen audience. 
not one of them with an unstable, undependable, unreliable righteousness. Not one. Because you have promised, I will establish you. You will be established in righteousness. In Christ's own righteousness. Lord, Britain desperately needs this. We can do without all these camps, all these little and huge holes of leakage from the public funds. Misused here, misused there, stolen here, stashed away there. Lord, we need to supply a moral grit and backbone to this nation. It's not just a knee replacement that is required. It's a backbone replacement. Have mercy upon the nation. We beseech you. Have mercy upon our families who breathe this sordid air. Oh, my Father, establish us in your own righteousness, feeble and frail as we are. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.